episode 137, interview with Matt Bell from Message Up. Welcome to the PR Playbook Podcast, the only podcast giving you actionable skills and advice you need to execute a strategic PR program. Warning, what you hear next may lead to brand awareness and increased sales and customer exposure. Now here's your host, Rinjini Joshua. Hello and welcome to episode 137. Yep, we are finally there, the number we've been waiting for. And today we are talking to Matt Bell, the founder and CEO of Message Up, a content marketing company. Hi, Matt. Hi, Ranjini. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Congratulations on reaching the magical 137. Yeah, it is the magic number 137. It's such a special day. Day. So I would love to do a quick introduction of yourself. Who are you? Where are you from? How'd you get to where you are today? And, And we'll have some exciting content marketing questions to follow. Sounds good. Well, I'm I'm Matt Bell. You might be able to detect from my accent that I've come from lands afar. I was born and raised in England, lived the first 20 odd years of my life there till I went to college and then roamed around the world. Uh, I was part of a large energy company for a while. I was an engineer. I'm an engineer by training. So we'll talk about how you get from engineering to marketing maybe in a minute. And uh, landed in the U.S. in 2001. I live in Houston, Texas. That's where I call home now. have done for the last 20-something years. And my career took me on a a really kind of serendipitous journey. I I, I was an engineer, as I said, and I I worked my way into a role involving new technology. And that led me into venture capital, helping to invest the company's money in in growing early-stage companies. And I got the bug for starting and growing companies there. And I ended up leaving to join one of those companies and, and eventually became the CEO, ran that company for several years. Did a couple more uh, of those kind of investor-backed business jobs. And then in 2019, decided, you know what, I, I've always been a builder. That's why I became an engineer. I like building things probably more than I like actually running a company because as it grows, more and more of that becomes finance and HR and, you know, love all those things. I don't think anybody likes running a company. Yeah, (laughs) it's funny. Once you you get to do it for a while, you realize it's not necessarily what it's cracked up to be. Not the uh, fun part. (laughs) No. No. It's nice to be the face of the franchise. It's nice to do that. But I was spending less and less of my time actually building the business and realized that that's what I really wanted to do. So I took a step back and and became a... uh, a strategy and, and marketing consultant trying to help companies position themselves and grow. And, and that's what I've been doing since. And I founded Message Up in 2021 after having spent a couple of years working with all the B2B companies and realizing that, that this content marketing piece that we're going to talk about was really at the heart of, of a lot of the challenges that they were facing. So that's a very short version of a, a twisty turvy journey. Yeah. I mean, it's really funny that you are engineer to me because, you know, we work with a lot of tech startups and anytime I talk to an engineer, they're typically communications wise incoherent. So, we'll get there. So we're, yeah. So we usually are the ones that have to bridge the gap. We have to sit there and ask them a numerous amounts of questions that they probably think are so silly and dumb just to get to the kind of the root of what they're trying to communicate to their audience. So uh, it's, interesting that you came from an engineering background and i came from real engineering hard making metal engineering not from the software side so i think we're still generally we're still same boat yeah yeah same boat same boat but no that's good it's good to know that you kind of have touched every part of that communication funnel right like from the user the engineering like the that architect to the person who architects the actual business side who has to speak clearly to get investors and do all that. And then to now, obviously, content marketing, which I've been saying for a long time, but I think now is finally resonating that content marketing and maximizing content is really the key to any good communication program. And there's so many ways to do that. And I think, you know, my my kind of piece there is I always try to say, hey, Public relations is bridging the gap between all the different departments within your company that communicate, but then also pulling those messages all together. Because oftentimes what we found is that like the sales team is saying one thing, the marketing team is saying one thing, the PR team is saying something, and 
they're kind of similar, but not really like they don't match 100%. And I think that's when you start having this kind of communication breakdown to your customers. They don't feel like it's consistent and congruent. So we'll talk about that a bit. <laughs> Quite likely. I use the words authenticity and consistency far too many times for my clients liking, but those to me are the two like things that underpin all great communication. If you're being authentic and you're consistent with it, people will trust you and you can do business with them. So I'm interested to hear your perspective on like how, I guess, business development in general for especially small companies, startups has changed why content marketing has become so important. I think you actually have to look at the buyer and not the seller. And I think that's where the biggest change. So if you think about your own life, right, we used to go to the store, you know, I, I want to buy myself a t-shirt. I'll, I'll go you know, in, into the city and I'll, I'll go to a few shops and I'll look around and I'll touch and feel and I'll buy. Now I would never dream of doing that. You know, I get my computer out and I search and I read reviews and I order my t-shirts and I wait for them to show up in the mailbox. And so the consumer B2C market is, is way ahead. It's a very advanced digital uh, buying experience. And what's or they're happened... impatient. They're just impatient. Well, <laughs> that, it, yeah, right. It's convenience, right? We yeah. love convenience. And so it's very hard to go back from convenience to something less convenient. Um, mm -hmm. And indeed, you know, as a society, I think we're figuring out we might have got a little too convenient and we're, and we're trying to make some of those backward steps. And it's hard. It's hard to give it up once you've experienced it. What we're seeing is people taking that into the industrial or the B2B space. So the people that are doing the buying there are also human beings. And in their private lives, they're also sitting on their couch buying everything online. So lo and behold, they go to work and say, why do I need to get on an airplane and go and visit a supplier or go to a trade show? Why do people have to come and meet me in my office, which means I have to put my smart clothes on? <laughs> why can't I do all of this online? And that transition was happening already pre-pandemic that we were seeing more search and evaluation and even purchasing online. And then of course, with the work from home, you know, the shutdown of the pandemic, all of that got accelerated like it has everywhere yeah. else. And that's going to stick. Right? And yeah. so now a lot of those buyers who used to sit together in one office in headquarters are scattered all over the country or even all over the world. So if you're a vendor trying to reach those buyers, you have to do it digitally. You cannot now go and knock on the door and say, hey, let me show you what I have to offer. Yeah, absolutely. So that brings us to the whole idea of content marketing is pretty much king. So when you're a company that's looking to promote yourself, and obviously there's so many ways that you could do it, I find that a lot of our customers get caught up in the, okay, what exactly should I be producing as far as content? Yeah. So where do you guys start when it comes to identifying, oh, what kind of content should I produce? So I'm going to sound like a school teacher um, mm -hmm. and say, do your homework. Because I think companies think that they can leap into content marketing. We know who we are. We know what we want to say. So let's just bang that out in a blog post or social media or wherever. And I like to rewind from there and go, okay, before we start, why are you in business? Who is your ideal customer? And let's think about it through their eyes. And so we do a lot of what we call buyer's journey mapping, thinking about that buyer all the way from when they first become aware that they might want something you produce. So them going through the evaluation phase of seeing what alternatives are out there to choosing your solution and then going on and implementing it and hopefully becoming an advocate for your brand. In those early stages, thinking about, well, what do they need to read or, or see in a video or hear in a podcast? Right. What information do they need to receive somewhere in order to be able to progress through that journey and arrive at a decision to buy? And to me, that tells you what that relevant, helpful information is you should be sharing and also tells you where you should be sharing it because you can think about, well, those prospects, where are they going to find me? Where are they going to go look? Are they just going to go to Google? Are they going to go to YouTube, the other big search engine? Is it on LinkedIn? Are they on Facebook? Mm -hmm. uh, are they, are they going to read it on a billboard? I mean, there's so many places we can put content. But I love, I love having these conversations because as you're talking, I'm like going through my mind, where are they going to find me? Where, yeah. you know, like I just, I have these conversations with myself all the time and it's, it's so funny to remind yourself. You have to, you have to, like you just said, you take your ego out of it. It's not about you. <laughs> it's about the customer. And you have to remind yourself, yeah. what exactly are they doing at that moment when they need your help? And that's especially true for businesses that have been around for a while. If, if you're mm -hmm. running marketing for a tenured business, let's say it's been around 40 years and it grew up long before digital marketing was a thing. Right. And all of a sudden that company is realizing we're not getting seen. We're not getting found in the places that we used to because the buyers aren't there anymore. The buyers are now sitting on their couch in Timbuktu, wherever they are, and they're looking online. So 
the company has to stop putting information where it has traditionally done so and perhaps wants to do so and actually force itself to, you know, to do content marketing somewhere else. And when there's a finite resource for doing that, you've got to be pretty selective. Uh, one right. of the bees, I, you know, bees in my bonnet is always don't do random acts of marketing. Don't do one billboard here and one social post there and one blog post there because all of those algorithms and your customer actually reward consistency. They want to see you in the same places over and over so they become used to you and start to trust you and see you as a trusted source of information. It's like a sense of curiosity building, right? Yeah, I mean, how often, I, and I, I work with clients all the time that, you know, a few months into the process of, of kind of doing content marketing, right? If you'd like, we'll say, wow, we've just had three customers tell us they're seeing us everywhere. We seem to see you guys everywhere these days. Mm -hmm. And the answer isn't that you're everywhere. It's you're in the places that they notice you. And so you know right. you're on the right channels like, when you start to It's like it. when you're buying a brand new car. <laughs> this is like, you know, you like, you figured out what car you want. And then all of a sudden you see it all That's the it. time. Yeah, there's loads of them. Very yeah, true. No, and in the same color. Amazing. Oh, uh, yeah. You're like, wait a minute. Wait, do I? And then you're like, do I really want that? Do yeah. I have to pick a different color? Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, that's, that's very true. And and I think that's something to, for people to remember, too. It's, it's the same thing like the car example. It's like once they're kind of ready to make a decision, they see you everywhere. But then they're not just seeing you. They're seeing your competitors as well. So you're you've kind of given us the insight of like okay what should you do and you should do few and like more and few uh different tactics but how do you pick the type of content that you're putting out like how do you know that the type of content that you're going to put out is going to be effective like i guess those are two different questions sorry i jumped ahead of myself <laughs> they're kind of they're related to each other and, yeah and there's i think a common answer which is you have to experiment marketing is a game of experiments there is mm -hmm. no fixed answer if the answer was fixed everybody would do it and then it wouldn't work for anybody right you would right. just everybody would be doing the same thing so it's a constant game of trying to find out what's working best what's resonating both with humans and with algorithms right so linkedin famously changed its algorithm last week and all sorts of people are up in arms because all the posts that they were putting out aren't working anymore and that's the reality. The goalposts keep moving. Marketers can never win, poor souls that we are. So first of all, it's figuring out, well, if I'm the buyer, what kind of content do I, do I notice? What kind of content do I find engaging? What kind of content do I have time for? If I'm marketing someone who's yeah. an extremely busy person, don't send them a 53-page you know, ebook. That, that's unlikely to work. But at send the same time... Or something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Let's, so let's focus on snappy things that will get their attention and, and engage them. Each channel has appropriate content, right? So a billboard, you could only fit 12 words on that you can see from 800 feet away or whatever the formula is for billboards. A LinkedIn post, maybe it's a thousand characters, a blog post, a thousand words. So, you know, formats fit. A big question at the moment, I think, is video versus text. You know, people yeah. are increasingly receptive to video buyers, even business buyers will go to YouTube before Google. So they like to see a video more than they like to see pages of, of links and text. And so deciding, okay, well, what's going to work best in video versus what's going to work best written down versus an infographic, for example, or. I, yeah, I think, I think it depends on what you're delivering, right? Because yep. like, there are some things where I just want a quick answer in, in a Google. Yep. And then yeah. there's like, okay, I think this requires a quick explanation. Then I would go to YouTube. So I think, I think that's also something you have to think about yep. when you're creating those content. And it varies by stage in that buyer's journey. So if they're mm -hmm. at the very early awareness stage and they're just trying to figure out what is this problem I'm trying to solve and what kind of solutions exist and what are other people doing and is it even worth my time? Mm -hmm. That's one kind of content. Once I move into evaluation, I need more factual content. I need to be able to, you know, tell me how I should be comparing different solutions of this type, what matters, what doesn't matter, how I should evaluate that. And then once I get into the actual purchasing, well, now we're down to nuts and bolts, right? You want to know pricing, you want to know uh, what training is available, what kind of support do you offer me and things like that. Those different types of content lend themselves to different formats. Maybe it's videos earlier on, maybe it's a more informative article in the middle, maybe it's a knowledge base and FAQ at the end. The function of the information, the purpose it's serving really helps to, to define what format it goes in. One of the things that you mentioned just a little bit ago was experimenting. And oh, yeah. that to me, like in my heart, it makes my, like it, it, it hurts me because I'm like, God, that means to me, experimenting t equals time. And yep. I'm a very impatient person. Can you imagine how it sounds to an engineer where there's supposed to be a formula and a right answer for everything? It, I mean, it's, it's horrific. It, yes. 
And so like for me, I want I want to know something's going to work and it's going to work quickly. And I know a lot of startups also, you know, they don't always have the luxury of time or the resources of time and money. And so what do you say to the I mean, I, I mean, again, I'm in the PR game, so I know things take time. I've done a review where it doesn't come out for six months and you're just like every day I'm like just trying not to bother somebody to post a review because I know that a normal human takes a long time. So how do you navigate along around these like time constraints and and what do you plan for in advance? Because I just feel like there's a lot of impatience and because there's so much information and things happening all the time, our level of patience has, has declined drastically. Um, I know mine has. So what do you say to people when, you know, you're also talking about experimenting, what does that exactly mean and how much time does that take? Yeah, it's it's an uphill struggle. I, I, and unfortunately, we're, you know, if you have a common sense conversation about marketing, you realize it, it takes time, it costs money, and, and it's quite hard to get right. If you just look at your social media feed, it is full of people saying it's quick, it's cheap, it's easy. Give right. me a very small amount of money. I'll put 50 leads in your inbox tomorrow. You'll be a millionaire exactly. by the end of the month, right? which is all nonsense because if any of that actually worked, again, we would all jump on it. Why wouldn't we? And then it would stop working. So, so we know at a sort of sensible level that, that, that it can't be that easy. Experiments don't have to be complicated and they don't have to take a long time if you do them right. Mm. And what do I mean by right? I think the mistake I see a lot of companies making is experimenting with too many things at once. Yeah. And then they get a bunch of answers and they go, well, we can't actually tell what worked and what didn't because they're all sort of overlapping and mixed in. So it's about, for me, it's about saying, right, what's the most important answer I could get today between A and B? What, if, I, if I crack that one, then that takes me down a certain path. Let's go test that first and okay. only that and get an answer. And then let's test something else. And then let's test something else. And I think the companies that experiment most successfully run lots of experiments, but they do them very efficiently one after the other, not lots, lots of things in parallel, very methodical. Yeah, mm. very methodical. I, I work with quite a lot of early stage companies who do have very limited resources. Um, and one of the answers I give them that they don't like is there is a minimum price to pay. If you want to be seen, if you think about who you're competing with, yeah. Even if you're a small company and you think your competitors are other small companies, it's not really about who's in your space. It's about who else is competing for that buyer's attention. And so if they happen to also buy things from big companies, those big companies are spending a billion dollars to- They're to also your competitors. their attention. They're also yeah. your competitors. They're, They're your indirect sweet. competitors. So I love it. I love it when people come to me and say, oh, I don't have it. We don't really have any. We don't have any competitors. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's right. Because your buyer is absolutely sitting there with nothing in his head. Captivated. Head. They're just waiting. For they're you. just they're mesmerized. All they do is watch you all day. Yeah, I wish that was true. I'd love that to happen once. The undivided attention of a buyer. So yeah, it takes something. And, and so there's been, there have been several situations where I've sat down with clients and said, look, if you want to do marketing, if you really want to get seen in this market, you need more money. You, you are going to have to spend more than you thought. You haven't budgeted enough. So either find it somewhere else or go raise some money. But don't right. think that you can do this for free. It, it really isn't going to happen. You can create some brand awareness for free. You can grow something organically. But generally, the less you spend, the slower it will be. So if you want it you, quick. You are going to have to spend in some so way, spend somewhere. Yeah. yeah, you could, like you said, you could get things for free. Like we, do, we focus on earned media most of the, most sure. of the time. But for us to get the earned media, you'd have to have made some kind of headway in a different area where you have to spend money. So it's... You got to earn it. You got to earn it. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think that's like, there's no, there's no quick wins. And it's hard for people to hear that. Even it's yep. hard for me to say it. Well, I imagine it this way. It's, you know, if a new brand that is selling something I want to buy, right? So let's go back to my t-shirt, whatever, right? You know, a yeah. new manufacturer comes out and they spend a you know, millions and millions of dollars to make me aware of it. They, you know, they just put it everywhere. I'll notice it, but that doesn't mean I'm going to trust that brand. Sure. Uh, that takes time. And we talk about touch points. How many times does a person have to touch, experience your brand before they'll go, yeah, I think I'm comfortable enough for them to, to purchase. Well, for consumer goods, for small scale, you know, maybe it's 15 times, 20 times. But what is it if I'm going to spend a million dollars on buying something from you? Right. It's a lot, right? I've got to really see you around. And in fact, I probably want to interact with other people that have bought from you. I want to hear 
user feedback. I want to hear see user generated content. That doesn't happen overnight. And so yeah. to build trust and to build an emotional connection with the buyer and get to the point where they'll say, okay, I, I believe in you. I'll, I'll purchase from you. Inevitably takes time. And I talk about, you know, anywhere from six to 18 months for a, for a business to business company to really see the full benefit of a, of a content marketing program. So that leads me, you mentioned connection. And so I want to go back to this question of, okay, well then we're building a connection. What, how do we figure out what to say to them? I would go back to the, the buyer's journey mapping that I talked about before. In the absence of anything else, ideally talk to them, right? We, we'll talk to existing customers. We'll talk to people who we know are prospective buyers. And we will ask them, what is it going to take for you to make a choice? What kind of information do you need to decide which widget to buy and who to buy it from and, and how many that you need and, and get those answers? But even, even absent those interviews, we in our minds can put ourselves in the position of the buyer and say, well, someone who's buying a thing like this, what kind of, what kind of concerns do they have? And so we think about that awareness phase and say, what do they need to know to choose to move forward and evaluate a solution? What are their beliefs at that point in time? Mm -hmm. positive and negative sure what are they what are they what are they experiencing emotionally that we can play on you know what kind of emotions could we can we you know kind of stoke up maybe it's fear of missing out because everybody else is using that thing maybe sure. it's fear of change in which case we want to try to, to to lower it and say don't worry it's not such a big change after all this is actually quite similar things like that so we can look at needs wants beliefs emotions at that stage in the journey and say what kind of information can we share that is useful to that buyer that they can receive and go Okay, yeah, then it's worth me going forward and evaluating a solution. I think I think one other thing that could be like a good tactic in this, and I, I do this sometimes, every once in a while I'll do this, but if I don't have the answer for my own company, I will go see in what answers other companies in my space have Absolutely. created for that. And see, is that like, oh, was what they said actually useful? What, like, was that whole experience I had with this competitor actually pretty compelling? And I think people don't do that because they don't want to say that, again, I don't have any competitors or I don't want to, you know, like steal somebody else's idea. But the truth is, is like it's an experiment. So you have to pull data from like lots of different sources. And absolutely, um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If someone's already experimenting, why not at least figure it out? See, so I, I mean, I think that's the other great thing about the noisy market is that there are things to look at. There's examples everywhere of things that work, things that don't. I mean, as a marketer, I'm sure when people send you emails and they're really good, you're like, oh, that was a really good email. Like I get excited to see. I'll them. save them. I'll save yeah. them and use them to look at later and get inspiration from. Yeah. Exactly. I even use like, if I see an advertisement that I think is really good, I'm not even in advertising, but I'm like, oh, I'm sure a customer of mine might want to do that someday. Or even if I see really good LinkedIn posts. So I think people really need to grab from real life, like what attracts you because that might attract another customer too. So I don't know. I think, I think it's a good way of kind of maybe just also taking yourself out of your like element of like, I always say drinking your own Kool-Aid. Yes. You know, people, people are doing that a lot, especially in the market that we're like the startup, small business, entrepreneur, you know. Yeah. And I you think talking about you're talking about it from the customer's point of view. So if you're always talking about your product, it, your solution, its features, its benefits, mm -hmm. that's very me centric. I need to talk yeah. about here's what the, I'm going to talk about the challenge that you're facing and what it's costing you and how my solution can help you. That's more value. The other thing, I mean, yes, it, it's okay to look at your competitor's material and say, oh yeah, they wrote an article about that particular aspect. I think I should write an article about that too. Good idea. Because, you know, if they've cracked the nut, like you said, don't reinvent the wheel, but where's your value? Looking, people are not looking for facts. People yeah. are looking for opinions. I can go to chat GPT and hoover up all the facts that I want. Yes. But I have an authentic opinion about it. My company has an opinion about why my product is better and why I can help you. And that Absolutely. opinion is what you should be communicating. Yeah. It's the expertise. That's the level of like, that's the service. Right. The customer service that people are. And, and the city, because if I put my spin on something, if I took my competitor's messaging and put it out there alongside something that I'd written, you'd be able to tell the difference straight away. I mean, human beings have a tremendous antenna for, you know, the BS detector that goes, that's plagiar. That's not you. I can tell you didn't write that. Right. It has right. to be in your own voice, in your own company's voice and, and, and authentic content. That's funny that you say that. I, um, 
wrote a book and and the ghostwriter like whenever she would give me a chapter I was like that's I would never say that <laughs> I would just never say that and I was like you're supposed to take the work out of me having to sit there and write but it's like sometimes you just can't do that you just it doesn't work they don't that's have true. a voice it's true at the company level I mean when people are yeah. um you know are using ghostwriters to produce blog posts same kind of thing um mm -hmm. You know, they need to realize that you can't just take that lock, stock, and barrel unless that ghostwriter is really, really familiar with your company's voice and tone and, right. and the way you write things. Somebody's got to go through and edit that up and turn it into something that sounds like the company. So one of the things that you were mentioning earlier was video, text, like format, basically, content format. And I want to kind of explore that. I always tell people to explore different formats. So, you know, we talked about don't try to go and do all different types of things. But you can play with different formats in the same message. So you can, let's say, write a text about a, a, mes a specific message, write a video about the same message, and maybe do some other kind of audio clip about that same message. But yeah. like, how do, you, how do you play with formats? How do you select what format the person should deliver in? Because I feel like you can get lots of different customers if you just switch that up a bit. I think there's two ends of the spectrum. If you're too one dimensional and you only do one type of format, you're clearly going to lose some potential customers. So if mm -hmm. I have some customers who are only video and some that are only text and I do one or the other, well, by definition, I've lost others in an, some sort of ideal world on the other end, you'd have every format of every piece of content, which clearly is a, probably a waste of resources. That's overkill and, and, and not even right. achievable for a lot of companies. They just don't have the bandwidth. Right. Um, so I think it's. It, a lot of that is about what you're communicating. Um, you know, we've mentioned that already that, you know, some things just lend themselves to being produced as an infographic. Some things lend themselves to being talked about in a video where I can show and explain and show the thing being used in real life that I can't do in words, or it's much harder to do in words. Other times, if I'm explaining a list of facts to you, I don't need a video to point at a list of bullet points on the screen, you know, text is there. So I think that the, the information itself is going to lead you towards, um, certain types. But yes, back to experimentation, what's working best with your audience, double down on that. Don't go exclusively that, but do more of that. If that's what your audience is loving your videos, then make more videos. If they're, if they're not responding to videos, but they're loving the, you know, the, the short form LinkedIn posts, then, then divert your effort there. Yeah. I, I, I do think video is such a big thing because also, again, I think people sometimes overthink it. You know, yep. they think, oh, it's got to be produced and it's got to be, you know, perfect. And I don't, I actually, I don't know that that's true. I don't think it's true. I think it just has to be kind of clean and, and nice and you don't have to make it 100% studio made. I agree. I think the tools are out there that, you know, everybody can be an amateur video producer these days. Um, yeah. And it's on, you know, what you're accomplishing as a business. So if you're, as a business, you are a very formal, polished, everything is kind of, you know, very precise, then putting out some sort of hash together video will look, you know, dissonant. It won't quite fit. Right. It's authenticity again. Uh, back to authenticity. But I agree with you. I think, I think people shy away from video because oh, that's very expensive and it takes a long time and, you know, batch produce them. Let's right. script up five or six videos, hire somebody to film it if you want to. And, and that doesn't have to be extremely expensive either. And then spend a whole day filming a bunch of video. You can turn out you know, multiple pieces in a day for, for fairly affordable, uh, professional, but affordable, or you can do it yourself. Uh, yeah. Where there's a will, there's a way. I feel like absolutely. I just, yeah, it's never, I, I used to wonder like, oh my God, how am I going to get all this stuff done? And then, you know, doing batch content is always like such a great idea because it's just like one day and you can get a whole month of stuff, yeah. you know, it's like, and you get in the flow of it. And I think that's, right. you know, what's hard with batch content. Well, I say hard. Content marketing is a team game. Usually the whole company is involved in content marketing in one way or the other. So if I'm the marketer in the middle that's tasked with, you know, really producing it, I need those nuggets, those seeds of information from the CEO, from the CTO, mm -hmm. from the sales team that are going to tell me what to write about and, and the, the, the opinion of the company that I'm trying to communicate. So the hard work actually is really hoovering that stuff up. Once I've got that, I can, then I can sit down and do a whole batch of posts and line them up for the next three weeks and feel, you know, and then come back to it later. But yeah, getting that, figuring out the best way within your organization to, to transfer those ideas out of people's heads and 
you know, into a file or onto a piece of paper where then the marketing team can turn it into good content. That's, that's challenging sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Content. I mean, it's, I feel like it's a rabbit hole of things that we could talk about. So, you know, I want to be mindful of everyone's attention because I think we've talked about a lot of different things that people can yeah. go back and kind of listen and, and walk through those different steps. As a takeaway, what do you think is one thing that a marketer, a founder, or whoever's working on this content can do to really identify like the next step? What should like, you know, what should that be, you think? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat a little bit on this answer and I'm going to give you two because I see two main areas where companies gain a lot of ground if they, if they focus on them. The first is if you haven't done it already, go and build a journey map, whatever you care to call it, for your buyer and put yourself in the buyer's shoes and say, right, what information are they looking for in, as they become aware of the problem, as they're evaluating solutions that they're choosing to buy? That will tell you a lot about what kind of content you should be producing, where it should be going. And then I think, you know, the, the second big thing is to, is to review the content you have. So look at what you're putting out there and say, am I getting, you know, a lot of companies get very focused on uh, prospects that are ready to buy now. And so they're putting out a lot of content that's about the product. It's about its features and benefits, but there may be missing content for those earlier stages. So make sure that you can, that a buyer can actually make their way from the beginning to the end, that you have content to help them through the whole journey and balance up the content that you're putting out so that it caters to prospects at different points along that journey. Because if you just focus on the ones that are ready to buy, a lot of them have already made their mind up. They know what they want. They know right. where they're going to get it. And it might not be from you. If you've got content that's, that's um, winning the mind share of people who are earlier in the journey, those prospects that will be your customers later, uh, you'll catch those chips in over time. So that's I like that business. idea of, of the first step that you said was building that map. So then you can kind of maybe list those pieces under that Absolutely. specific stage. Yeah, I like that a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. Easy to do. I'm going to do it after we, we're wrapped here. <laughs> Excellent. Let me know I'm how you get on. I'm working on my journey. I mean, I do. it's so, it's horrible to have these, horrible and wonderful to have these conversations with all kinds of like communicators and marketers and stuff because every time I have a conversation that triggers my brain, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go do that after we talk. More stuff to do. Yeah. Yes. There's always stuff to do. Always stuff. Well, thank you so much for your time. I think this has been like, again, a good conversation to sit and digest for a minute tell people and we'll have this in the show notes but tell people where they can find you any information about you that you need to share so the company website is messageup.com and if you go there you will find me you will find links to my linkedin profile you'll find ways to contact me so that's the first point uh, you'll also find in the in the main nav you can click on books and you'll see the two books that i've written about content marketing uh, one is called Content Marketing Mission Critical. That's for CEOs that are designing content marketing strategy. The other is called Content Marketing Making the Magic Happen. So that's actually for the marketing leaders that are tasked with operationalizing it. Um, mm. so that's under books in the nav there. And uh, if not, I am matt at messageup.com. Everyone is welcome to email me. Easy. Great. Thank you so much. My All pleasure. Right, turbulence back here. Okay, well, this is fabulous. This has been a, such a wonderful conversation. And guys, I will have all the show notes in here, the transcription, all the information about Matt. And good luck with your content marketing. There's no time like right now to get started. We will talk to you next time. <laughs>